Welcome to Behave Yourself, the podcast that aims to bring the science of human behavior and how you can apply it to your own life and become the happiest, healthiest, and most successful version of you. We're two behavior analysts with backgrounds in personal training and nutrition who struggled in the past with confidence, weight loss, breaking promises to ourselves, and constantly trying the quick fixes. We bring the science and show you how to apply it confidently and consistently towards your own goals and how to actually create a lifestyle change. Behavior analysis is the science of human behavior, and we all engage in behaviors that either move us towards the direction of our goals or hold us back from living the life we desire. I'm one of your hosts, Emily McRae. And I'm your other host, Joe Wesley. Hello. Hello. How's it going? It's going. It's been a week for sure for all of us in this country. It's been a little less than great and proud. But um, overall, I've kind of just continued to maintain my own health and habits goals and focusing on what I can control. So I focused a lot on just increasing my vegetables and not by a ton, literally by one serving a day. And then I continued to take my vitamins without my tracker. And that's a huge win for me. I, there was one day where I didn't do it until I got home. Maybe it was Saturday. I didn't get home until the gym after the mid morning, but I remembered it and it cued me. So been consistent with it without my tracker, but I still think I need some sort of check throughout the week or something or the end of the day did I take both of them because I think I still need some some support and systems in remembering them but overall I was successful yay good maybe reporting on the weekly podcast will be your accountability yeah (laughs) I may need a little more than that currently but it can fade to that at some point so how have you been behaving yourself I listened when you spoke in our previous podcast about movement and progressive overload and muscle building and we have recently cleared up our living area and we've moved some furniture around and when I started working out this week I had you in my head of I do need to start lifting heavier than I have gotten into the habit of lifting because I just pick up the same weights each day and because the weights had all moved around the room and I couldn't be bothered to go and get my usual weights, I thought, oh, I'll just I'll just do leg day with these weights. It, it'll be fine. I'm stronger, I'm sure. And um, yes, I've been rather sore not being able to sit down without squealing, which Jim's found very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Behaving myself, listening to you. And I feel like it's shown me what I can do and that I need to do some more stretching. <laughs> For sure. I think we all do. We all kind of need a little bit more stretching in our life nice I'm excited about today's topic I am too this is our bread and butter and I train this topic with people all day every day as my job and it never gets never gets tired for me but I'm gonna say because I train people on the functions of human behavior in relation to children with autism I'm not allowed to mention children and their behaviors today. So I'm going to give myself a challenge of relating it to other human behaviors like we do on this podcast and not children with autism. Yeah, it's a challenge because that's how we really are. We view it so frequently. And even in we're in grad school, that's how we're taught is just children on the autism spectrum is really how it's focused. So this is going to be fun. And that's why we're here to show that actually ABA doesn't have to just be uh, related to children with autism. It's all human behavior. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. So what are the functions of behavior? What does it mean to say a function? Well, we've got four of them, but what the function is, is why is the behavior happening and what maintains it or helps it to continue happening or not happen? So what is the reason is really kind of where that function word comes in. What is the reason for the behavior? Right. And behavior analysts are in general agreement. Some people will say they're five, but the majority of us will say there are four functions of human behavior. Um, And the four whys behind the behavior. In theory, you could take any human behavior and categorize it into one of these four functions. That's not true, is it? I I think it's a lot more vague. 
than that. And it's also, there's multiple, ooh, let me speak correctly, multiply maintained behaviors too. So some behaviors have multiple functions of why they're happening. My head, I should have thought about this before we started recording. My head started, my mind started um, squirreling to operant responding, mm-hmm. respondent behavior, et cetera. So if it's like a, if it's a reflex, like a knee jerk, no, we're not talking about this. We're talking about learned behaviors. So for learned behaviors, there are four functions of human behavior. All human behaviors can fit within these four functions and we can have the discussion about control another day. Yeah. (laughs) We're going to leave that one. We're not going to go too (laughs) crazy. I know our behavior analyst listeners are like, please go on. (laughs) And our non-behavior analytic listeners want the simple, please just explain how this applies to me. Yeah. That's our goal. So essentially any human behavior carries on and keeps happening because something has happened afterwards. So if I um, walked into an empty bar and there was no bartender behind the bar and I said, red wine, please, and no red wine magically appeared, I'd probably never do that again because my behavior hadn't been reinforced. There'd be no why behind my behavior. There'd be no purpose to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so every human behavior at some point has been reinforced with one of the four functions of behavior. And we're going to go into those four functions. I wonder if it'd be helpful to quickly touch on the fact that it could be positively or negatively reinforced or punished. So maybe too much. Maybe we'll go into that at the end. Maybe in the end. And we can also probably go into another episode on that as well. (laughs) <laughs> Amazing. A new topic. Yeah. Okay. So one of the four functions of human behavior is uh, social reinforcement. So the idea that your behavior is mm, reinforced or rewarded or somehow the why behind your behavior is mediated by other people. So say, for example, I say, good morning, Emily. And she will respond with good morning, Joe. Right. That's been socially mediated. I get some kind of good feeling out of her responding. Um, It doesn't have to be verbal behavior necessarily. It could be that I smile at a stranger on the street and they smile back to me. Um, It's something social where the response is mediated by someone else. And that means that I will be more likely to do that behavior in future. I think this also plays into a lot of the social media that happens. And I am more inclined to post content if I get comments and people are interacting versus a like that's not as I know that used to be the thing is like oh you want to get all these likes I get like 17 likes I don't care but if somebody comments or sends me a dm about something that I posted that is reinforcing to me I will continue to post day in and day out about that because I know that it's something that's important to somebody else Right. So there'll also be different qualities of these reinforcers. So there could be social reinforcement that's kind of average and there can be incredible social reinforcement. So my favorite kind of social reinforcement is from my husband. Thank goodness. I quite like him. But (laughs) if I do something and he praises me or he makes a joke out of it or he teases me, that's just the best thing ever. Whereas if uh, I smile at a stranger on the street and they just nod their head and don't smile back, that's kind of average. I, you know, I don't like that quite so much. And so the stronger or the more quality, the reinforcement, the stronger that behavior will be in future, the more likely you are to do that behavior in future. Yeah. And I think this goes into, it can go into your work life too, of emails and like somebody sending you a, thank you so much for doing X, Y, and Z for me versus, um, they send you, I don't know, a small gift card for doing it. Like what's more valuable to you and what will increase the likelihood that you do that in the future yeah and as you say it can be through social media it could be through the phone it could be a letter it's just anything that's been done by somebody else that makes your behavior change in future yeah okay what's the next one all right next movie we got it kind of sort of ties into this because it is tangible so gaining access to items or other materials or stimuli in the environment so for if you're going to a coffee shop and you give them money my brain is not that was not what I was trying to say (laughs) and you ask them can I have a large iced coffee with sugar that behavior is going to be reinforced when you say, can I have a large iced coffee with sugar? And that's not what I drink, but they're going to give you and you're gonna gain access to the iced coffee. 
other behaviors that gain access to tangibles, you can gain access to items like buying shoes or sports birthday bras. Presents. What? Birthday presents. Birthday presents. Love a good birthday present. Stationery. Uh, hmm? Stationery. Ooh, a good notebook. Because mm. we all need another notebook for sure. <laughs> I definitely need another notebook. <laughs> um, but this is also, and some people will say, oh, well, it's social as well. It is partially social because somebody else is typically giving you access to that item. You can also get gain access to items by yourself, um, but typically it, is, it does have a social component to it because somebody else is typically giving you the item. And a lot of, I can't think of many behaviors that aren't what we would say it called multifunctional. They have many whys. And generally the more whys or the more functions a behavior has, the stronger that behavior will be. So your example of getting a sugary coffee, for example, it's social, you're talking to the bar barista. Yeah. Um, it's tangible, you get the coffee cup in your hand. It's automatic um, or so, kind of sensory. We'll come on to that in a minute, but it, it tastes good. It feels good to you. And it could be a form of escape or avoidance. You might be escaping from your work or escaping from your tiredness with a hit of caffeine, which brings us on to the last two that I've just accidentally mentioned before we've mentioned I it. I like that tie in though, because I think that's something that so many people engage in is this type of like getting coffee behavior. Well, how does that apply? Why do we do that behavior? I've got interesting reasons why I stop for coffee and I've figured out some of the functions of them, so... Emily, I drink black decaffeinated coffee. It's literally mud water and I still do it. <laughs> so there must be something going on there. There is definitely something. So our third function of behavior, what is it, Joe? It's automatic and it's, some people call it sensory. And I got told off quite roundly by my professors at university for calling it sensory. Some people call it sensory. It's more than just sensory though. It's something that isn't mediated by other people and it's typically within the body. Um, so it could be that you have a mosquito bite and you scratch it. It could be that you're thirsty and you take a drink. It doesn't have to have somebody else there. It's something that is within your own body. Mm -hmm. And it's a hard one, I think, for people to fully understand sometimes. And it's it's something that just, I kind of used to explain this to parents as it feels good yeah. and enjoyable. Like that's that's the best way to kind of explain it in such a simple way is it's an enjoyable thing that feels good internally, but it's other people aren't experiencing that. Or it doesn't feel good and you do something yeah. to make it better. Like you take a painkiller for a headache or you drink to, you take your coat off when you're too hot, you drink water because you're thirsty or whatnot. Yes. Cool. And the last one. So our last one is, and this is a dual one. So escape and avoidance. So escape is you want to terminate the aversive activity, the stimuli. Say you're in a really awkward conversation and you say, I, I have to go to the bathroom. You don't actually have to go to the bathroom. You're just using that as a reason to leave the really awkward conversation. Avoidance, if you know that the person typically brings up awkward conversations, you may change up your routine or your schedule or go get coffee so that you don't cross paths and you don't have that awkward conversation and you avoid the situation and you basically either postpone or completely stop the situation from happening. Mm. I recently got a work phone so that I could turn it off in the evenings and weekends. I am escaping. No, I'm putting it off till later. I'm avoiding my client calls and emails and messages in the evenings and weekends. Mm -hmm. And I think escape and avoidance, they're typically together, but they are very different in how the behaviors interact with the environment and time-wise with you, you're avoiding it because at some point you're going to have to look at those phone calls, look at those emails, but for the time being, you're avoiding it. I would say there's very few true escape, escapances. That's not a word, but I'm going to use it. And yeah. I think at some point it's going to come back and bite you on the backside. Like you can't escape it forever unless it's I don't know, someone that actually dies, you're going to have to kind of face up to it eventually, whether you, you're just escaping it for a, you're avoiding it for a longer period of time, shall we say. 
Yeah. I bring up the coffee thing because it's super automatic for me, actually, which I figured out. Well, it's automatic and it's access in a way. I like how warm the cup is. So when I, I have, I now have, thanks to my lovely sister-in-law, but I have a Yeti because my husband, I was stealing his. So <laughs> I got my own. So, but I have my Yeti and yes, Yetis keep things super, super cold or super, super hot for a really long time. However, they're not warm from the outside. If you guys are listening, I'm holding my coffee mug. It's not warm to me. It's not cozy. And like, I can, I can't feel the heat in the Yeti. So when I, if I stop to get a coffee, those cups don't retain heat. So they're warm. And I like that feel and that sensation of the heat on my hands or in the summer, the coolness of an iced coffee on my hands. And so I realized that. And so I actually did end up buying these reusable cups that are plastic. So they retain no heat. They do nothing like a Yeti. They don't retain heat. The coffee is cold in like probably 10 minutes. But for those 10 minutes, my hands are warm and the cup is hot and I enjoy that. So I've started to replace it so that I can have my homemade coffee in a cup that's reusable, saving the environment, but my hands get to be warm. Nice. Yeah, that's <laughs> almost certainly what I'm doing with coffee as well, because it's not yeah. the caffeine I'm getting. No, same. I, I, caffeine does really nothing for me, but the warmth of the coffee cup on my hands. And it took me a very long time. I didn't figure this out until probably a month ago. So nice. You may not know why you're engaging in the behaviors, but they have reasons. Yeah, and I guess that's important then. The reason why we're talking about this and teaching this is um, when you can work out the function behind a behavior, you're much more able to replace it with a, a similar behavior with a similar function, which is much more likely to replace it. That was a lot of replacement words. <laughs> but essentially, if you want to stop a particular behavior or change it, if you just try and stop that's going to be really hard if you can if you can replace it with a functional equivalent you're much more likely to be able to change so for example I wanted to give up caffeine I just replaced coffee with decaffeinated coffee functionally other than giving me caffeine it was the same it was hot it warmed me up it I went through the same habit of making it functionally it was the same yep that's the exact same for me it's all the same it's just now I have it in a warm cup and I don't have to buy it so Right. Last January, my hubby and I did dry January. We just replaced the wine or the gin that we were going to drink with non-alcoholic versions or juice or whatever juice. I said juice like um, I was going to say soda, but it wasn't soda. We had like non-alcoholic alternatives, yeah. but whatever behavior it is that you're trying to replace, replacing it with a functional alternative is going to be really helpful. So if you say I want to stop snacking on sweets or candy after dinner, replacing that behavior with um, a five mile run probably isn't going to go very well for you. <laughs> replacing it with frozen grapes probably will go quite well for you. Those are awesome too. Highly recommend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting. I was on a call with a um, new client the other day and she was talking about she does, she stress eats and she stress snacks. And I'm like, okay, well, what are you typically eating? Because typically it's chips or candy or sweets. She goes, carrots and broccoli and I'm like okay you're you're doing exactly what I would have said to replace because she's like I want something crunchy so I go and get carrots and I'm okay. like that's fantastic like I think you're on the right track but for her that's still a challenge in her mind and she wants to eat more mindfully so she's still doing this without an intention but the function of the crunch is what she wants so she's already there with the crunch it's just now we have to Kind of shift and change in other ways but we typically would replace snacking on chips or candy with maybe carrots and hummus because it still has that crunch and that same feeling of getting that access to the crunch well i guess that brings up another point if you can work out the function behind your behavior you can then do what i do with clients becoming the annoying two-year-old of but why so your comfort or stress eating or binge eating through stress but why to make you feel better? But why does it make you feel better? No. So 
instead of functionally replacing it with carrots and broccoli what are we going to do instead that actually will make you feel better so and there's lots of things that we do that we've talked about before so instead of just reaching for the crunchy things when you're stressed what else can you do instead and replacing that behavior with something maybe completely different that's not crunchy and not salty and not snacky Um, but you can work that out once you've worked out the function of the behavior is to escape the feelings of stress Mm -hmm. yes (laughs) all the functions (laughs) it's really I'm excited for this series so like going into the functions of food the functions of movement and why and how those certain functions play into our actions and our behaviors surrounding those I want to like dive into it now and I know we need to save it and have you know a little bit more succinct episode for you guys but it's exciting for us because this is really the core components of behavior analysis and why people engage in the behaviors that they engage in yeah um I've been listening back to all of our episodes like uh, the good podcast uh, that uh, I am and I'm aware that sometimes they can sound to some people a little brief my mum has commented hi mum that she would like some more information and maybe sometimes a bit complex which is why we've opened the Facebook group and people are asking very lovely questions in there so if for example there's something about the functions of human behavior that you haven't understood just come along and post in the group and ask the questions I would say at the moment the group is 50% behavior analysts and 50% non-behavior analysts and everyone is very lovely and supportive so if you've got any questions come and find us it's just behave yourself podcast um if you searched on facebook you can also email us at behaveyourselfpod at Mm gmail.com you can find emily on instagram at emily.a.mcrae m-a-c-r-a-e or you can find me at the behavior lady what else and we did behave yourself pod on instagram for Mm -hmm. us yeah i mean i think if you come into the facebook group and you even say like hey i'm engaging in xyz behavior and this is kind of what's surrounding it can you guys help me navigate and see what maybe be may be the functions of the behavior we can help you out or more clearly define different functions in there so definitely pop on over or send us a dm or an email and we'd be happy to answer for you guys yeah short and quick questions long and complex questions we might be asking you for signing up for services (laughs) exactly (laughs) Another disclaimer, uh, we are both behavior analysts and qualified in our respective fields, but this podcast is for education and information sharing only and shouldn't be taken as personal, medical or behavioral advice or services. And we will see you next time for the functions of food. Awesome. See you next time. Bye. Bye.